Welcome to Strength Chat Podcast, presented by Kabuki Strength. Introducing your hosts, Chris Duffin, the mad scientist of strength, Rudy Kadlov, mature athlete and coach, and the wizard of training himself, Brandon Sen. Welcome to Strength Chat with your host, the mad scientist of strength, myself, Chris Duffin. You know, I almost got confused giving that intro because I'm sitting over here in the seat of... What are you going to do? I, I don't know. Uh, so, Thanks a lot, Brady. I know. So today, instead of the you know mature athlete, we have the, the youngster... Immature athlete. The immature, <laughs> the immature Brady <laughs> Cable joining us who has stolen my seat. Um, he offered to give it up, but I'm not going to take, you know... That from no, no, I'm gonna own this new seat. That's it. Let me just make it known that I was lied to this eve when I asked Brandon if Chris normally sits in the middle. And you believe <laughs> Brandon. Yeah, that was my again. first mistake. That was my first again. <laughs> and uh, on the far end of the table, I can't gas him out quite as well during the course of the podcast, is uh, yes, the wizard of himself, Brandon Ross. So, uh, yes. So what are we talking about today? What Chris? are we talking about today? Uh-huh. You know, I'm glad that Brandon is finally like learning the ways. Mentorship is paying off. Uh, many, many, many years of teaching him the ways. Uh, one of those ways is uh, leadership through antagonism. I, uh, it is. Uh, it's a skill. You know, the PC like leadership management courses they teach you when you're going to school, when your fancy business books and all that. Like, there's the non-PC way that they always talk down. It doesn't work. But you know what? It does. It's like the dark force, the dark side. It it has power. It does it has have power. power. Yeah, it does have power. Brandon, you're learning the ways. Yes, yes. I think I will head this story up today. Let me paint a picture for our audience. Don't get so sultry, man. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, Mr. I deadlifted less than everyone else this week. <sighs> Just Brandon. Yeah. So as, <laughs> as many know, Brady is, uh, his deadlift is, is going very well as this, mostly this whole year, has been improving very rapidly. He's figured out some things, but not quite enough things. In fact, tactile things he has thus neglected to develop. So, Brady and I normally train together. Brady, myself, Stevie, a handful of others have a solid group. So, to start off, I took a deadlift that I thought was 617. Ended up being 640. I missed, obviously. How'd you find that out? You told me. Yeah. Kilo math is still difficult. I missed it. So then Brady goes, oh, that was actually 640. So that made me a little happier. So I went back down to, well, I think you took yours first. Brady is feeling a little saucy on the day and decides to take what would be then a new PR for 617 by 2. Ends up missing the second rep. Now, if I were to just stop for the day, Brady would have deadlifted more than me on the day. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. Not acceptable. No. We there can't will have be a, this. There will likely be a day where he you does, could applaud, you could congratulate him, you know, like do the PC stuff, like build him up. I could have built him up. Could have built him up. But instead, we must tear down first. That's right. So instead of just calling it a day, why don't you even know how it was a, a quarter of a kilo plate, the record breaker plate, throw it on one side of the bar, pull 617, thus more than him. 617.1. <laughs> yes, record break, only one record breaker chip. Only Not, one. You don't need two. You only need that's one. That's right. Yep. Notice Be- this beautiful happening. work. Beautiful work. I noticed this happening. <laughs> And I assumed, oh, Brandon, just put a little extra weight on the bar to get over that mental hump. You know, just uh, no. psychological trick. And then I realized <laughs> it was a psychological trick. Did. It was just to edge me out by that much. Uh, well played. You are, that, you are, you are learning. You are learning well. And that's what was in the news this week. Yeah. But like you said, that non-PC, non-correct way does work, which is why I'm in a deadlift board. <laughs> <laughs> at least, at least. I, Yes. Do you guys ever notice in the past that, uh, you know, when you're over there, like, deadlifting or other guys are deadlifting and I just happen to make it bent over row day with no warm-ups? Oh. And I just happen to select the same weight that those guys are using? Or you? Or their bar. <laughs> just 
just, there, bar, exactly. bar. I just walk over. <laughs> I don't know if you remember. That's, that's, that, that, that's I don't know the, if you remember. Subtle, subtle, uh, Christopher, subtle, subtle ways. Chris, Chris, subtle ways. Christopher Duffin. Um, but uh, in my last meet at this, I do not remember. In my last meet at this gym, it's a made-up record. I, You're uh, not your record. The I other took one. your final drug-tested record in the APA, <laughs> <laughs> never to be reclaimed. What was that record from? <laughs> Probably the 1980s. Okay. <laughs> Chris pulled like 620, uh, and uh, that's because it was the last time beat I, it by I, 30 pounds. I I I I can pull. I pulled 801 uh, drug tested well, as well, not, but just not that federation. So, well, it, you know. it doesn't matter then. I don't care about any other federations. I beat your deadlift record. No, You'll so. never take one of my deadlift records. <laughs> Oh, wait, yeah, never mind, because that, that 800 is at the 198-pound class, oh. which you could never see. Okay, well, I'm you about to hurt your feelings again. Mr. Fatty. I'm about to hurt your feelings again. Not only is Chris a retired powerlifter, but he doesn't even have the gym deadlift record for the 220-weight ah. class. <laughs> that's, that's, owned, that's owned by Matt Moore, I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's get to the podcast. Oh, where, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, that was a long that was a long intro for us today. That was a long intro. That's that's because we've got. Uh, oh crap! Lots you know what? Happening. Yeah, I, I where is Doctor Rudolph? He didn't kick the can, did he? Mm, he might have. He, he is mature. So today we've got the director of sports performance at DeFranco's gym, Cameron Jossie, on the podcast. Cameron, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here and. Uh... Listen to you guys rip on each other about deadlifts and gym <laughs> records and such. <laughs> well, gym records are the only records. Uh, uh, I, I I love that director of uh, of sports. Pro- I want a title like that, Cameron. That's a nice. It's title. just a title. Yeah, you know? it's, it's, a just, a, it's title. just a title. I still got to do the work that like it lives up to the hype with that title. So that's the challenging part. All right. well, <laughs> so so what 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 is the work that lives up to that hype? Uh, I was. I was talking to somebody the other day, kind of as a joke, because they're like, wow, you're the director of sports performance. Like, what do you do? Like, who do you manage? And I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm a staff of one. I manage myself. <laughs> yeah, so, like, yeah. so I was like, you know, Joe's Joe's kind of moving on, doing a whole bunch of other things, representing the brand uh, of DeFranco's. And I'm basically the sole coach at the gym now. And I do, you know, all the programming for the athletes. And uh, yeah, I, I don't manage anybody. I'm directing myself and directing the performance of my clients, I guess, but that's, that's about all that goes into the title. But that reminds me of Kabuki strength. We kind of all just give ourselves our own titles. (laughs) Well, I I love it. So, you know, Joe, Joe does his thing and you, you, you basically do all, do all the work of running the gym, right? Managing the athletes and yeah, we're at the point now where, where he and I will, we'll talk about training ideas. We'll, We'll launch some things off each other. Um, he basically, you know, he built the brand up to a certain point. And then now with what I'm doing is basically just trying to live up to everything he built the brand to. And then I'm just trying to branch it off further and keep progressing it. And, and you know, he's he's reading books. I'm reading books. We're trying to learn uh, more stuff that's coming out in terms of training or just different approaches to help optimize the process. And, you know, we'll meet uh, routinely, whether it's in person or just call each other, text each other, whatever. We just kind of talk about different ideas, you know, bounce them off each other. And I ultimately end up being the one that takes the athletes through all the training, but it's, you know, he still has a huge influence over everything within the brand. So it's yeah. not that he's not doing anything. He's certainly still very much involved. Absolutely. But obviously he's got to have a lot of confidence in, uh, in your abilities to, uh, to have you in the role. Uh, of such critical importance for the for the organization. So, and you know, we've met you a few times, so we have uh, we we have uh, an understanding of why he has that uh, that confidence. Um, but uh, <laughs> you've uh, you've basically been working with him for for a long time. Shall we uh, kind of walk through uh, walk through the background a little bit? Uh, how you got to the role that you're in now? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think the main reason he has the confidence in me is because I've. Basically, my my initial role with Joe was uh, guinea pig. You know, I was the I was the an athlete that trained under him when I was in high school. So he he tested out some crazy stuff on me, and uh, I I have to say I was definitely a victim of him uh, figuring things out and seeing if they work or not. And uh, there were you know many days, especially on the prowler back in the day on the blacktop, where I'd be 
uh, hawking up a lung and he's like, yep, that, that doesn't work. Let's move on. And, uh, yeah, so <laughs> I've definitely been through the ringer with him a little bit. Um, but it's cool. So he, he knows that, you know, I've always just been an open-minded, uh, individual when it comes to training. And it started with me walking into his door as a high school athlete and just saying, Hey, just, just make me better. I don't care what you do or how you go about doing it. I'm just ready to do whatever it takes. And I just want to get better. So, um, you know, saw some pretty good transformations in myself, just going through the program in high school. And, um, uh, I really think that allowed me to take the next step and, and play in college at university of Rhode Island. And that's where, uh, I studied exercise science. Cause I, I thought it was so cool. The transformation I made, I was like, I want to, I want to do this, you know, like I want to, I want to do this in, in my life and I'm in, in, in my career and I want to stay involved in sports and helping people just improve physically and uh, psychologically, even, you know, just trying to get, get people better so that they feel more confident when they're playing their sport. So, um, that's what I did in college was study uh, kinesiology specifically. And the whole time I would come back and train with him in the summers. And I started shadowing him when I was in college in the summers as well. And then um, that led to me basically just being offered a, a, a job by him where he said, Hey, I got like this really bottom of the totem pole position. If you want to just come and take a few clients and, you know, it's on you to find the clients. It's on you to get them in and, and work with them. He's, you know, he, he's like, I'm not going to tell you how to write the programs or anything. He's like, you know, our system, you know what we're doing. So just like put your own twist to it and kind of do what we all have to do, which is, you know, find out real quick what works and what doesn't. And, um, made a lot of mistakes my first couple of years working with them. But, uh, ultimately it was enough where, um, he appointed me to go down to Austin, Texas for two years when we were kind of doing a co-branding experiment with that company on it that um, ultimately just didn't end up working out just because of our um, different interests in terms of what we wanted to do. And uh, we felt it would it'd be better for us to progress if we go back to being a standalone. And that's basically what we did. It was no, there was certainly no bad blood with on it or anything. It was just you know, they wanted to take their business a certain way and then we just wanted to take it a different way. So that's all it was. And, um, yeah, so I basically ran the training down there and that's how I got the fancy title. Um, and then coming back up here, I just kept my fancy title <laughs> coming back to new, coming back to New Jersey. But, um, yeah, down there, I had a coach working under me, uh, CJ McFarland, who's still working down there with on it. And he's a great coach. And, um, so I did have to manage at least one coach in my, in my life, uh, as the, as the director of sports performance, but now it's just me. So I, I, I'm back up in New Jersey and East Rutherford now, and, uh, just trying to take our, our New Jersey based training to the next level. <laughs> so Cameron, you talked about your background a little bit, having yeah, formal education in you said kinesiology. Yeah. Obviously there's a ton of people that have degrees in kinesiology and exercise science, but not many of them are working for DeFranco or people like him. What were yep. some things that you did early on that you felt set you apart or some traits that you expressed that helped set you apart and kind of got you to where you're at now? Uh, I think really the number one thing that that I almost lost, which a lot of people end up doing, uh, I think is just losing the ability to keep an open mind and, and understand that you're you're probably pretty dumb and don't know that much. So um, I think a lot of kids, they go to school and they study kinesiology and because they're studying it all the time, they start assuming that they have it all figured out just because of what a book tells them or something. Um, and, you know, there's no hands on experience in college. It's all you're sitting and looking at a PowerPoint. I mean, how much do you really know about what you're doing? And, um, you know, they teach you basically stuff that's centered around health and specifically like cardiac health. And, you know, they're not teaching you how to you know, deadlift 617.1. Um, but they're, <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're trying to, they're trying to teach you how to just be a healthier person. So in terms of training athletes and stuff, you got to understand that there's a whole nother complex system out there of how to learn how to do that. And it's not something you're going to learn getting your bachelor's degree or even your master's degree, mm -hmm. you know, having just finished my master's pretty recently. Um, so I think that's definitely the number one trait is just always assume that you're dumber than you are, you, you know, have confidence, of course, but I'm saying like from, from a perspective of never stop learning is basically what I'm, what I'm getting to. Like always try to seek to understand more. And there's always another form of complexity. You can take things and just trying to, you know, just figure it out as best you can without, with, 
without or while understanding that you're you're never going to fully figure it out basically you know yeah. so i think that's definitely the number one trait that you need to you need to hone in on um in order to progress in any field that involves a, a kinesiology degree any anything that involves exercise or health for that that standpoint either if you're a doctor it should be the same way you know always try to figure out what's on the cutting edge of medicine or whatever it might be yeah, and it sounds like you really involved yourself with somebody that you looked up to a lot and wanted to learn a lot from early on. A lot of people kind of miss that step, but that's where you get a lot of that practical experience that you were talking about. We get emails all the time from people that just graduated their exercise science program that want to come intern here, but we don't need 100 interns right. running around here with nothing to do. Need to, right. Like you said, you started off by being coached by them, and then you started with just some right. low totem pole job and built your way up from then and learned the system from the ground up. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, you know, going out and finding relationships is, is like absolutely one of the biggest parts of, of this field is just, mm -hmm. um, being able to, uh, develop trust in somebody that you look up to. Uh, and that's, you know, I, obviously I did that with Joe, which really helped jumpstart my career. You know, if I, if I hadn't had Joe's influence behind me or like the DeFranco name behind me, I, I have no idea if I'm on this podcast, like you guys probably never would have heard of me, you know? So um, certainly gracious about the fact that Joe's allowed me to build myself up within his brand, but that definitely started with me, you know, just, uh, attacking the training a certain way that, you know, and just building those relationships while I was a trainee mm -hmm. and then, um, carrying that forward and taking advantage of the opportunity that Joe, you know, was working at this, had this gym while I was in college and I would come back and train there and just say, Hey, you mind if I just shadow you? Like you're training me anyway, you know me. Uh, you mind if I just hang out for a couple hours after I'm done training and just kind of shadow and see what you guys are doing? You know, it's just something as little as that goes a long way. Yeah. And there's definitely a different feel to the DeFranco's brand now than there was maybe five years ago even. You know, when I first started following Joe, it had to have been five, six-ish years ago at what I w believe uh, – it was a bigger facility than you guys are at now. I don't know the exact location of it, but it had a very kind of garage feeling, hard nose style training. A lot of like almost what we would uh, it, for powerlifting think about like West Side esque, you know. And yep. now there's a real uh, sense of like advancement, you know. Not to say that what they were doing weren't you know the correct thing at the time, but there's a real feeling of like really utilizing all of the tools and resources that, uh, you know, we're understanding more about the research or even just uh, experience. So uh, one of the topics I want to get into today with you was uh, what some of those things uh, that you're currently utilizing. So I know you're really big into velocity-based training um, and some other stuff. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing with velocity-based training right now with some of the athletes coming through DeFranco's gym. Sure. Yeah, it's cool to uh, – the development of the brand from that standpoint, because, um, you know, the first gym I trained out of was pretty much just a weight room. And like I said, we were pushing prowlers on pavement in the back, you know, mm -hmm. so that was, that was before we had any kind of turf or any field access or anything like that. Um, you know, and Joe, like I said, he's always been about how can I get the best out of what I have available to me? How do I maximize my resources? Um, and at the same time, he knows that he's always learning something new every day. So, uh, yeah, the programs totally evolved where, you know, we were pretty much very heavily weight room based when I first started training there, cause all we really had was a weight room. So we weren't really doing a lot of speed training or, you know, we just kind of did what we could. We would do sled stuff outside and the, on the pavement, but, um, yeah, it's definitely evolved a lot into now we're trying to utilize, um, certain forms of technology that we feel are, are essential to what we're trying to do. And, um, we're definitely not trying to do too much with tech to the point where we're like over overly analytical and we have like too much data to analyze. We're just trying to figure out like, how do we chop it down to what we definitely want to measure? And then how can we find something to measure that? So that's kind of what we started doing with the velocity based training is we said to ourselves, Hey, you know, like, instead of always just using percentage of one RM, especially for these guys that are in the NFL and, you know, their bodies fluctuate so much on a day-to-day -day basis and their, and their state of readiness and their preparedness is, is constantly fluctuating. Like how can we just go about uh, quantifying the, the training volume, the resistance training volume um, to where it, it 
self-regulates itself and just kind of fluctuates itself basically uh, or accounts for those fluctuations and that's what we've been doing with the the velocity based work so we we invested in a tendo unit we just you know kept it simple with we, we didn't get like a gym aware or um any of the ones that have like crazy data because like i said we like to keep things simple so all i wanted to all i wanted was just was just a number that provided feedback for the athletes so as long as it was something that could just give them the velocity output, then we could tell them what range we want them to aim for. And then now that's just going to self-regulate the day. Um, so that's been a huge addition to what we're doing because, you know, we, like you guys said, we, we do stem from a West side approach, um, which I, I always love Louis stuff because he's, he's so good at, at simplifying the process, you know, like he's, He's so good about basically saying like you lift you lift some heavy stuff you lift some heavy stuff fast you you jump and then you move really fast and do sprint work or something like that so those like basically those four pillars is basically like what our um, our program is just based around it's not anything super complicated but the velocity based work really helps especially when we're doing the dynamic effort stuff because now you know we used to tell guys. Hey, like just go for speed, but like nobody knew how fast the bar was moving. You know, we had no idea. Like, oh, it looked fast, but then if you put, uh, if you actually put a device on there to measure it, you realize what you thought was fast wasn't fast enough. You know, so it's it's pretty crazy when you start putting numbers to it, and guys start realizing that they they can't lift fast. That was that's always the cool the cool thing I see. Well, it's not really that cool. It's unfortunate, but it's uh, something I notice when uh, college guys come back from only doing heavy lifting at college all the time without any velocity based work or whatever. And we get them back on the tendo unit and they, and they struggle to find that speed again, you know, cause they're just used to going heavy and just grinding through it. And, um, you know, we all know how, uh, the form looks for the most part in the college sector. It's not very great, you know? So that's the other thing too, is how well the, the velocity based work keeps the form in check because there's no, there's no risk anymore of them, really failing out you know we we know if the if it starts slowing down too much we can just light lighten it up or whatever it takes yeah and you, you mentioned uh moving the training program at defranco's from a heavily percentage-based training to now velocity-based training um and i from some of the work that i followed from you you're really doing some cool things with like velocity deficits so um, that would be you're identifying uh, maybe an individual profile for one of your athletes and uh, looking maybe where their minimal velocity threshold falls and then developing a program based off that to improve to the left or right of that. Tell our listeners a little bit about uh, the idea behind velocity deficits and, and how that can really individualize the training process. Yeah, so basically the work I, I've been doing with that has been heavily influenced by um, the research by J.B. Marin and Pierre Samazino and uh, Matt Cross and some of those guys that are specifically looking at jumping and sprinting performance. Um, so I haven't dived super heavily into it from kind of what you guys do, where you're analyzing the lifts very specifically. Um, you know, you guys being from powerlifting background, that absolutely makes sense for what you guys are doing. And then with what we have with the athletes, I, I like using the jump and sprint uh, profiles because that'll help kind of dictate more uh, towards purely field-based movements and stuff like what how they're going to progress um, in terms of how they move on the field. So yeah, basically like what it came down to is the people that are forced to fish and it makes sense, you know, they're just not really strong enough. They need to improve their force output. So um, and that can be applied to they might not be strong when they jump and they might not be strong in the sprinting motion either. So it's not just weight room strength. It, it's specific to the context that we're talking about. Um, but then when they talk about um, velocity based work is really just the, or if you have a velocity deficit, it's can can you produce force in the face of a lot of speed? You know, so can you produce force at very high speeds? It's basically what it is. So um, all I've been doing is really if, we determine that somebody's velocity deficient when they're jumping, then we're going to put more of an emphasis on um, dynamic effort lifting when we're doing resistance work. We're going to do probably more unloaded jump work or even assisted jump work, like band assisted jumps and stuff like that, because we're, we're basically trying to speed up um, speed up the environment. So they're in the face of higher speeds and just seeing like how much, how much can they produce any force in that environment. And the same thing goes with sprinting is if they're, uh, velocity deficient, which most 
you know, we work primarily with football. Most of them are, which basically just means they struggle to uh, produce force at high speeds. That's why a lot of times guys will pull hamstrings or, you know, you might see some injuries come into play when speeds start getting higher. They can't handle that. So um, that's a common thing you'll find with football players is velocity deficits. Uh, it, it really, the other thing with, with people that are velocity deficient is they have they do have trouble contracting their muscles very fast as well, which kind of goes into the same thing. So um, that's, you know, we'll find that with the example of what I said with those college guys, when they come back, they can contract with a lot of force if they have enough time to complete the lift. But once we tell them, hey, you guys don't have that much time, you need to hit this speed, that becomes a, an issue for them. So they don't have, they don't have the, the ability to contract their muscles fast or just perform the movement fast. So that's, that's some of the stuff you see when guys are velocity deficient. Uh, it's, uh, it's very much along the lines of what we do, obviously in slightly different contexts where you're a lot of what you're talking about, it's like quality specific training. And, and we're really looking at the barbell lifts just it for the, for the lifters that we have anyway, which is the predominant, uh, majority of our clientele. Um, we're taking each individual lift, looking at their profile. And one thing that I've really been wanting to experiment with is, uh, is is looking at uh, our lifters MVT because we know that even though powerlifting is titled powerlifting power is a is a quality that's probably not that important for lifters as much as it is force development so um, if someone has a very high MVT so we'll say like for the squat um, and for our listeners who don't know yeah, say, did we define MVT for that's yeah so M- MVT is the minimal velocity threshold so it's it's about what we think a lifter can move or I- anyone who profiles a movement uh, can move uh, a maximal load at so um, traditionally for a squat we'll use the example we might see an MVT somewhere between 0.2 to 0.3 um, closer to 0.2 might favor a slightly more qualified lifter uh, point three and above, we typically see uh, for people who are lesser qualified in, in the context of powerlifting or, or force development. Um, so one thing that I, I've been uh, really curious to start experimenting with uh, with our with our, our clientele is, uh, can we actually drive training decisions based off MVT uh, reading? So if we have a new lifter who comes in uh, whose MVT is very, very high in, say, a squat, will we have a higher return initially if we can shift that profile to the right a little bit? And I think that we can, um, but then the question becomes, you know, what do you do after that? So um, those are more just ideas and theories that I have right now that I think would be interesting to play with. So I know, like... When you say, when you say uh, their MVT is high, are you saying that they're they're hitting their maximal load at... at um higher speeds yeah a faster velocity than what we would otherwise (laughs) see so uh, yeah and there's definitely exceptions to that so one that comes to mind uh was uh sean doyle which if you don't know super accomplished squatter uh lifter in general one of the strongest all time um we handled his training uh for the u.s open and when we initially profiled his squat um he was somewhere in like the 0.4 range which there's could definitely be some testing error in there and some uh, some errors with their uh, with the linear regression used. So there might be some plucking of data points and so forth. But um, towards the end of his prep, we actually saw that shift more to the right, which uh, is tough to say with just an individual case of someone who's that efficient. But I tend to think that there's probably some lifters who have um, maybe. Uh, limb proportions that favor higher velocities, maybe some that favor lower velocities. So uh, an example yeah. of that, I, I tend to think that a lifter who has short femurs and maybe a very long torso probably favors higher velocities in the squat. Uh, I think someone with longer femurs, maybe a, a shorter torso. I, I don't know what the torso length on that would be, maybe longer, but I think they would favor uh, slower velocities. Yeah, don't, for, don't forget attachment points. So attachment points can have a huge output on uh, on uh, the force production yeah. as well. Yeah, that's uh, definitely yeah. beyond what I've what I've uh, been looking into. But yeah, I think there's a lot of things that could affect it for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of these, a lot of the athletes we work with, um, you know, just based off what you guys just said, is the they they 
they can explode like the higher level guys they can explode great but they can't grind you yeah. know what i mean so it's mm-hmm. like they they can you know they hit a certain lift at, at a nice speed and then all of a sudden they just can't budget off the floor it's crazy exactly what um, we're talking about yeah yeah and then the question for me becomes well is that something that we should try and influence or is that is that more to do with that lifter's genetic makeup and i i don't know that the answer to that i think we could probably come up with some different theories and stuff from uh, further testing or maybe monitoring their training. But it's hard to say, you know, maybe that lifter is just a fast squatter. Maybe they're just a slow squatter. It's, it's, you know, that's, that's a question that uh, maybe needs more research done. In order I, I, to ask. I, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, obviously, you've got some neurology at play. Um, so you can definitely shift as you develop, you know, that, uh, the, that firing. But, like, I, I think that there's also a certain level of, uh, genetics involved with, like you said, limb length, attachment points, all these other, and just, you know, predisposition predispos- pre- of, you know, uh, m- you know, fiber type and usage and all that other stuff. So, you know, you're going to find some people that are always going to be faster. Can you shift that? Yes. Mm-hmm. But, like, there's, there's definitely going to be a difference, I think, in genetically. When we also see that muscle fiber types can actually change very, very rapidly based on yeah. uh, exposure to stimulus and magnitude of that exposure. So the other question of that is, okay, what was the training that preceded this testing period? You know, if that lifter was in a very uh, high volume, lower weight phase, like, of course, their minimal velocity threshold at that immediate testing point is going to be much higher. So how much decision does that now uh, drive training? And so there's, there's a lot of different ways that we can uh, kind of look at this. And I, I also think that uh, this is much more important for the lesser qualified uh, lifters, I think. Uh, so I, I'm still specifically talking about uh, weight training or powerlifting for us. But um, I think this becomes much more applicable to lesser qualified lifters because the more qualified are going to generally trend towards that um, more ideal profile. So the ideas of profile for me are, are pretty interesting because I think we can we can probably do a lot more with them than what we are now, or at least that I am now. Yeah, you know, it's hard to say what others are doing, but interesting stuff. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's interesting with the uh, you know we we always talk about with our athletes is like understand the intent of what you're trying to do. And, uh, you know, it's who's to say, you know, if you, if you're describing an intent a certain way, you know, whether it's to grind through a lift or whatever, do they eventually just kind of learn how to do it? You know, maybe not as well as somebody who's naturally predisposed to, uh, be able to do that. But, um, you know, if they're intending on doing it, telling themselves, telling their body to do it, you know, who knows, can they, I'm sure you can see some improvements there for sure. Yeah. In, intense, also a really interesting thing, not directly attached to what you just mentioned, but I, I would imagine, especially if you're working with multiple team sport style athletes, you apply uh, something like a velocity device to a squat, you know, see who can move this load the fastest, I think is a probably a great way to motivate the training environment or to improve that. And uh, I, I liken the, uh, you know, velocity based training to really like effort based training too. You know, because it's it's really easy to not make progress with velocity-based training if you don't try, you know, and if you're constantly moving slower speeds when you can be moving them better and faster, you know. A lot of times when uh, we'll get a lifter who says, well, I I hit this at this speed, should I go down? My default is usually like, well, you know, just do it better on the next set. And if you don't do it better, then go down. That's actually a common terminology used in our gym, like when the velocity isn't where it needs to be on some of the warm-ups is, oh, it looks like you need to try harder. Yeah. Like that's the yeah, do, that's it the, do it better <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like put some put some intent behind it. Like don't go through the motions. So. Yeah. Once people get it, they kind of get it. Yeah. You know, with that. So that's 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 something that I really have enjoyed with specifically velocity based training. I think it's a little harder to do that with subjective ratings because you can kind of convince yourself one way or another. Yeah. Depending yeah. on maybe arousal level and. Uh, other factors i think it's very easy to convince yourself that something was easier than it actually was yeah or harder yeah or harder maybe you just want to sandbag it yeah do it better is a really common phrase in our gym for sure and when i describe people that have (laughs) never used velocity-based training what it is they're like well don't you ever just like you know go lighter because you're kind of sandbagging i'm like no i just don't do that no you just yeah yeah, that's not an option (laughs) just don't do it yeah Yeah, no Do do you guys ever uh you guys ever have clients that are like 
well, how do how do I move the bar faster? Like, what what exercises can? And you're just like, no, no, just just move the bar faster. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, all, all of our yeah. training is just, speed training. What's the secret yeah. sauce? Uh, just do it. <laughs> yeah. Just do it better. <laughs> I agree, hundred <laughs> percent. So I don't think we've actually touched on it in the podcast, but obviously we're talking a lot for powerlifting, and you work with quite a bit of team sport athletes, if I'm not mistaken. Could you talk about just the types of athletes that you're spending a lot of time working with? Uh, yeah. So we have. Uh, we have guys that come back to us uh, in the off seasons that are in the NFL. Those are pretty much the only pro athletes that we have or NFL athletes. Uh, we also have a handful of guys that are free agents, so they're trying to uh, get signed again. And um, you know, those, that's an, always an interesting group to work with because they they work very hard, and you, you know, you hope the best for them. Uh, then you know, we have some college guys that come back, but they're not higher level college guys. Uh, they're typically Division three, Division two, maybe uh, one double A. It just depends on if they can come back in the summer or not. Um, and then the rest of them are, are high school people or high school athletes, uh, primarily football from that standpoint as well. But then we also have a small handful of uh, general population people that are just goal driven. You know, it, most of them just want to look a little bit better, maybe get stronger. Um, and that, that's our, our main requirement for clients. We tell them like, we, we just want you guys to have a definitive goal. If you're just, if you're here to just, you know, oh, I don't really know what I want. Well, go down the street to the other gym, you know, cause we need to design like a program for you and we want to see progress and track it. So, um, you know, that's pri- primarily why we work with athletes is cause they, they play a sport. That's the goal within itself. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of, you know, we're, we're up for training, anyone and everyone, you know, just depending on what their goal is. And we, we love the challenge. Football is our biggest sport, but, um, you know, we definitely love trying to figure out what makes things tick in other realms, whether it's a sport or just a goal or whatever it might be. You also have a a handful of professional wrestlers. Is that true? Uh, yeah. Guys that are, um, in the independent setting for pro wrestling that are basically trying to make it to the WWE. So that's kind of a, a unique uh, setting that we have because of Joe's connection with the WWE. And um, he's he's actually the official strength consultant for the WWE. So, yeah, that's super cool. Um, yeah, a lot of guys reach out to us that have that goal. And um, we, we basically know exactly what they're looking for because we have that direct funnel with Triple H, who is the, you know, chief – operations officer of the wwe and he's the one that recruits everybody to uh go into the nxt which is like their their minor league uh setting for wrestling and then from there they try to progress into the wwe so um yeah it's kind of a cool unique population that we have uh that those guys that we work with no super cool you worked with the undertaker for a while yeah (laughs) yeah i did awesome Uh, tell us a little bit about his training is there anything that makes it unique is there anything that uh you know, that's uh, more interesting than just getting in the weight room and putting the work in. Yeah. So he, he has probably more injuries than anybody I've ever met in my life. Uh, if you look <laughs> at his, he's, he's, he must've been under the knife, you know, around 20 times. I mean, literally wow. it's, it's unbelievable. And he, he just went back under the knife this past <laughs> after WrestleMania. So um, yeah, he's, he was a, a really hard project for me. A, because he's a freaking legend. So I was nervous as hell, you know, like I need to get this right type of approach to it. Yeah. Um, and B his injury history was off the charts. Like I just said, so that was a huge stressor. You know, how do we train around, uh, the fact that he has like no knees, no hips, like Mr. No Potato shoulders. Man. Yeah. And so, um, that was the next challenge. And then the third challenge was that he didn't want to be careful. He's like, just let me lift weight and crush shit you know what i mean like yeah. this is so that was like the psychological barrier i had to cover with him was that he he wanted to go full out like he he just didn't even care about being careful you know you, you talk to your clients he'd say like how does that feel or you know are you all right or whatever if you if you get a, a hint that something might be off he's he could have broken his leg he'd be like no i'm good i'm fine right. you know so uh, yeah he was a challenge but he ended up being um what easily by far one of my most dedicated clients, like literally just did whatever I wanted him to do. He didn't argue too much. He would, he would hint here and there at like, you know, I kind of want to see if I can work up to a 500 deadlift or something like that. You know what I mean? So, and it was, it was funny. I actually let him try to do it one time, but we had to go off of some pins cause he's so, he's so tall, tall that man. off of, off of, uh, 
some pins. I had him try 500. There's a video of it somewhere um, just to feed his ego a little bit. And uh, he, because he's so tall, the, the pins were still like below his mid shin. <laughs> like it was still like slightly above his ankle, but that's just how long his, <laughs> his legs are. Um, it, I mean, he did it, but so he, I probably would never have him do that again, but uh, yeah, that was, he's, that, he's, it was fun working with him. He's got to be a pretty freaky athlete too, right? Just probably oh, just yeah. crazy, just maybe genetic potential, like just freaky. You know? Yeah. He, he probably could have been a pro athlete. Um, he, I don't think he ever played football, but he used to play basketball. He basically quit basketball to become a wrestler. So, um, it, first of all, he's tall as hell. He's a giant. Um, you know, he's six eight or six nine, whatever he is, and he's he's three hundred pounds with like zero gut. Like you don't even you don't really see it. And um, yeah, he's just he could have been you know pro athlete for sure. I think he has that potential, and he he even with so his knees are so beat up that he can't really like bend them too much or he has trouble uh bending them at least he did before his more recent surgery so when i was working with him um because he recently uh got his hip resurfaced so now he can actually squat to depth which is kind of cool um but when i was working with him he couldn't do that because of his hip and one of his knees as well but he wanted to he wanted to jump like he wanted to do box jumps and it was funny because uh you know you see guys basically drive their knees up when they try to box jump right and he couldn't do that because he didn't have that hip flexion. So he ended up doing like a 40 some, I think it was 42 or 44 inch box jump with like almost no <laughs> hip That's flexion. Crazy. Like he just, he just jumped up there, you know, and uh, at 51 years old and it was nuts. So uh, yeah, he's, he's definitely one of those guys that just uh, has that underlying genetic makeup where he can just keep going, you know, like he's, he just doesn't have to stop really. That was really cool. You know, when you're training some of these younger hopefuls, what uh, how, how much of an emphasis do you place on, like, say, maximal strength versus um, maybe energy system development, or or do you are you even concerned about that? You know, these guys are lifting other humans above their head and tossing them, but they still got to be able to go for like ten minutes nonstop. So, how do you manage those two uh, maybe non complementary qualities? You're talking about with the with the wrestlers, yeah, with the wrestlers. Or- yeah, the pro wrestlers. Yeah, I, we're we're kind of adopting a similar setup as what you would see with if you were training an MMA athlete, um, just from the uh, stamina standpoint and energy system standpoint, we'll do that. Um, but we still put a huge emphasis on um, strength and like when we'll do different types of strength as well. So like we'll definitely work on, you know, primary lifts that are uh, like the power lifts, like squatting and deadlifting and benching and stuff like that. But then we'll We'll also do a big influence of uh, strongman type work as well. So teaching them how to drag stuff, carry stuff, lift stuff, and drag stuff, you know, like any combination you can think of because that's, you know, pretty much what they're doing. They're just picking guys up, walking around with them. They're putting them over their head, walking around with them or on their back or whatever. Um, but then you also have to include elements of uh, explosive work because they got to be able to jump. they got to be able to jump out of the way or whatever. Uh, and then you have to include elements of acrobatic work too, because they got to do a lot of acrobatic type stuff. Even if they're a big guy, they got to know how to roll. They got to know how to, you know, maneuver themselves on the ground. So that's, those are all different elements. So it's, it, there's a lot that actually goes into it that people don't consider. And then on top of all of that, you have to make sure that they're jacked. You know, you have right. to like, do, you got to look good. <laughs> yeah. You got to do like bodybuilding with them. So it's crazy how you basically have to start with like kind of an MMA approach, but then add in some, gymnastic elements some strongman stuff uh and then some bodybuilding stuff on top of that yeah a lot of people think of the wwe or professional wrestling as just a show but these guys are just really complete athletes you know if you could probably put them on most fields and they would probably perform pretty well well you know what's funny is i i don't know how true it is but i heard that um they'll go to like the nfl combine or something and mm-hmm. hand out flyers and say hey if this doesn't work out come see us oh that's uh, you know? so funny so, <laughs> So they're working on trying to get actual athletes in there. And that's yeah. the big thing about some of these guys that are, are training for it that think that they can get by just being, you know, wrestlers in the ring. And they're yeah. like super un- unathletic. I'm like, no, you guys need to like get more explosive. Like this is what they're looking for now. Yeah. Got to be able to move. Exactly. How do you guys think? You guys got any other topics off the head? 
Yeah, I had one thing I want to touch on a little bit. You hinted earlier, because obviously you work with a lot of high school and college athletes, you were saying. What are some yep. really common deficits you're seeing across a lot of those people coming from those backgrounds? Um, definitely, definitely a lot of slow people. <laughs> like, like just, just, I think we're at the point now in the, in the field where, um, virtually everybody understands the value of strength. So, um, a lot of people are pretty good lifters for the most part. I don't want to say like great lifters by any means, but they're familiar with it to enough where we can kind of coach them up to the point where they're like pretty good lifters and they, and they have good technique and stuff. So they're familiar with that side of it. But what, what needs to definitely make a shift in the athletic realm is the more explosive type stuff and the speed stuff. So like I, I played four years of football at university of Rhode Island and it didn't do a full speed sprint in four years training there, you know? So when you consider that standpoint, it was like warm up, go to the weight room, start doing cleans and then do squats and then lift, you know what I mean? So, um, and that's pretty indicative of how a lot of the programs are. There's definitely a good shift towards more explosive qualities, uh, that's currently happening. But, um, yeah, that's something that a lot of guys struggle with. If they don't inherently have it, they assume that they can never attain it. And that's um, not true. You know, like the best example I've ever seen is the fact that um, Usain Bolt showed the ability to get faster leading into his his uh, most recently set world record, the 958. So you think about the fact that like the fastest guy in the world, if you think about diminishing returns, like the fastest guy can get faster than certainly – almost anybody can get faster, you know, to some degree, you might not be very fast in terms of relativity, but you can still get faster. So you can be fast for you. And if your coach is telling you, Hey, we like you, but we just need you to get a little bit faster then like, you should probably work on that, you know? So, um, they're not saying like, Hey, we like you, but we just wish you could like, uh, bench that guy off you that just tackled <laughs> you a little bit more. You know? So, um, it's, I look at, I was on another podcast recently where I, I talked about how lifting for, for athletes is a lot of it is, uh, almost like an insurance policy. Like you're, you're taking out insurance and, and, and ensuring that their structural, uh, components are, are developed and resilient. Um, but it might not have a super direct transfer or it probably won't have a direct transfer to what they're actually doing on the field, but you still should do it because, you know, you need to make sure your body is resilient and robust. So that's kind of how I look at it. That's a really good way to look at that. I think that might be a good point to uh, to uh, end uh, end uh, the discussion on today. So I got one. Oh, more you do. Question okay. For Cam. This one comes <laughs> from Joey D. Joe DeFranco himself gave us this question. Joe. Gave us this question for you in, in the podcast we did with him, and right. uh, he we asked him at the end, "Hey, we're gonna have Cam on. What should we ask him?" And he says. When you started first training with him, that uh, your mom refused to pay for training with Joe, and so you had to get a part-time job to in order to actually train with Joe. And he says, yep. where was that job at? <laughs> I went down the street, and I applied at Dunkin' Donuts. And that's, uh, how I, <laughs> that, that, that's how I paid my way through uh, DeFranco's training when I was in high school was uh, – 16 hour weekends at Dunkin Donuts serving coffee and donuts and they had a Baskin Robbins attached to it. So I had to scoop ice cream and you know, that was, that was my active recovery work was scooping out ice cream and such. Oh, that's not even bad. Joe led us on to think it'd be a lot worse. But still, <laughs> some stuff that not everybody's willing to do to train with somebody. That's no, <laughs> exactly. Totally. A high school, exactly. A high schooler too, for yeah, sure. Exactly. No, it's very cool. Yep. All right. Yeah. Dunkin Donuts. <laughs> I'm satisfied with that. Okay. Now that now now we can end it. Now we know. Now we know. <laughs> now, now we know. I'm still questioning about the Fraggle Rock in the background of the uh, up here, but that's that's all right. The what? Oh uh, yeah, the the Fraggle up Fraggle. There. You see the Fraggle? Yeah. Fraggle? It's been staring at me the whole time. I don't know what that is. You yeah, you don't know about Fraggle uh, Rock? I oh. saw that up there. I don't know what a Fraggle Rock is though. Oh man, it's a show. It's a yeah. show. I think I think they call those individually. They call them Fraggles, but they live on Fraggle Rock. Yes. So that's uh, that's my fiance's old. Fraggle from her childhood. So, do you know about this, Brady? I have no idea. I'm younger than you. Oh, the, yeah, young kids. <laughs> How old are you, Cam? I'm 27 right now. I, see, he's see, as old as see. I am. I don't know about that. I still have it. <sighs> I, I barely, I barely remember it, um, but I definitely do remember it. Uh, my mom had one of those v- Fraggle Rock VHSs in the house, and when I was real young, so. <laughs> 
right. I definitely yep. remember All it a little right. bit. All right. Well, uh, Cam, uh, where where can people find you at or what's the best place? Uh, it looks like you're writing for a few different places these days or have been the last couple of years. Um, but uh, where, would, uh, where would people go to uh, contact you, see what you're doing, all that sort of stuff? Uh, well, I basically treat my social media like an online journal. So I just kind of put all my content on there. And then uh, that's for Instagram and Twitter. And for both of those, the account name is at Cam Joss, J-O-S-S-E. So at C A M J O S S E, um, you know, I do some writing pretty regularly for simplyfaster.com. And, uh, other than that, it's, you'll find me with, uh, anything Joe's doing and I'm working on getting a, a website going. That's basically just going to be like a personal blog type setup, but it's not there yet. But, uh, you know, I'll let you guys know when it is. <laughs> All right. Cool. Sounds good. Been a, uh, been a pleasure talking to you today and have a good rest of the day. Yeah. Thank yeah, you so thanks much for having Cam. me on guys. All right. Yeah. It was all right, take care. Talk to you later, man.